So today I am here with Amanda Gagnon, who, you know, you and I actually have so much in common that I feel like (laughs) this conversation could probably go on for five hours, like some Joe Rogan (laughs) experience episode or something. But um, but, uh, yes, (laughs) Uh, and we've actually never even chatted in real time before. Um, So it's pretty exciting that we're we're getting to talk at all. Um, But why don't you sort of give like... A, a brief introduction to to who you are, and then we can talk about some of the things we have in common and some of the things that I think I could probably learn <laughs> learn from you. Uh, absolutely, uh, I've been looking forward to this too. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. I yeah, so I'm a dog trainer. I have a business in Manhattan, which is something we definitely have right in line with each other. Um, I've been dog training for about a decade now. I'm also an anthrozoologist. That's where I got my graduate degree in. And I, which means I study the relationship between people and animals. Um, obviously, I focus on dogs and humans. Um, and I really am particularly interested in dogs and humans in foreign cultures. And so I combine, I spend my days typically training dogs and reading lots of books and talking to lots of people about how they feel about dogs based on where they live and who they're around. Um, so it's a pretty fun, pretty fun life, I think, because that because is so, I love dogs. so yeah. interesting. So where did you where did you study anthrozoology? If only I had known that that was a thing one could study, but tell me oh, more. Tell me about it. I you know, I spent so many years looking at animal behavior graduate programs because it seems like that's what I should do. And every time I would read the curriculum, I would feel like it was missing something. And then I came across the anthrozoology curriculum. It's at Canisius College, which is upstate New York, and it included so much about the human side of the coin. And I realized, oh, of course, that's what's missing from a lot of animal behavior, the human animal, Um, (laughs) which I I didn't get into dogs just because I love dogs. I got into dogs because I like the way that relationship that we have with them. I think it's really unique and cool and interesting. So yeah, Canisius College, it's a really cool program. If anyone's interested in that, it's um, partially in person, or at least it used to be before the pandemic. And it is partially remote. So it's a pretty accessible thing. It's a lot of work, but it's a pretty accessible thing for people like you and me who work full time. So. Um, and you have a master's degree from there? That's right. Mm-hmm. Is that like a two-year program or? It can be, but not if you have the kind of schedule that we keep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it took me four years to do. Uh, and where are you from originally? I grew up in Virginia. I was born in New Hampshire, um, so that's where I spent my summers, but I grew up in Virginia, so I think of myself as kind of a Southern slash Northeast girl. And did you study anything having to do with behavior then in in college? In a way. uh, No, not really. (laughs) I was an acting major in college. Um, So in a sense, I think what drew me to performance, um, there are some fun things about performance that I like, but one of the things that drew me to performance is sort of analyzing the psychology of the characters and getting inside the minds of different types of people. So I think that's the through line for me. Um, But no, I moved to New York to be an actress and did some acting theater stuff here. Um, And then one day I, when you're an actor in New York, if if you don't know, you usually have to have a day job. Oh no, it's just one long, (laughs) sweet dollar. I thought (laughs) (laughs) literally literally one (laughs) dollar. Exactly. Uh, So you take a lot of day jobs and one of the day jobs, that I took was at this sort of underground doggy daycare and meaning it was out of somebody's apartment. And I I loved playing with those dogs so much that I never went on another audition. I started my own dog walking company, realized that I didn't know how to handle half of these dogs. And so I started studying training. Um, And one thing led to another, I ended up touring, um, being lucky enough to help Ian Dunbar in one of his tours. And I learned a lot from him and you know, the rest of my education is pretty self-built through conferences and the way you have to do it as a dog trainer. At least these days, there's a lot of really cool online programs, but there weren't uh, 10 years ago. As you know, I think you started around the same time, didn't you? Yes. Yes. About 10, 11 years ago. And mm-hmm. uh, I I mean, I, I kind of on a whim enrolled in the Karen Pryor Academy, um, knowing not very much about different programs and not very much about training at all. Um, Mm -hmm. which is interesting only in that I think so many people that do the Karen Pryor Academy come come at it with many years of experience and are just sort of trying to like you know put a put a a cherry on the top of the Sunday of their knowledge (laughs) and I I went it I went in knowing like 
absolutely nothing. And, uh, and of course got a lot out of it. And, yeah. um, but yeah, I mean, how crazy that here we are to two women running two of the only storefront, uh, dog training facilities in New York city. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Starting around the same time, you know, I didn't realize that Karen Pryor had a Academy 11 years ago. I, that's the first time I knew, I mean, I know about them now, of course, but I feel like I didn't get a sense of them until more recently. That's awesome that you found that. What a great place to start your career. It's one of the best. Yeah. I, I think yeah. I was really lucky, but also, you know, there's so much, like you said, there, there's so much education that you can get from resources that are out there, conferences, books. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I don't think I would have known about any of those things um, if I hadn't done the KPA program. Like it, it kind of like set me on a path to figuring out what I, what I needed to do, what I wanted to learn. Um, yeah. I mean, it's an awesome, probably gave you an awesome compass. Cause I feel like back then it was, can we say back then nowadays, Oof, back then back it when. was, <laughs> more of a wild west even than it is now in terms of trying to figure out which teachers to follow and I think the most important thing was finding good teachers um, because if you found teachers that didn't align with your values you could end up training in very not so great ways oh yeah yeah and it was hard <laughs> and I, I don't know if you found this but I found it was very hard to um, I mean just talk to people it was hard to find like uh, uh, anywhere to apprentice and it, and it was hard mm-hmm. to find any kind of mentor. Um, so, you know, with the school for the dogs, I've kind of part of our, our goal has been to create a, a community. I mean, the podcast, I guess, is part of that, a, a sort of open community where people can get access to, um, to, to learning about how to become a trainer in addition to, you know, obviously providing services, but Absolutely. Um, I think that's a great goal. Yeah. Um, So we could talk about a million things all day long because um, (laughs) we both are these crazy dog loving science nerds who um, (laughs) run storefront (laughs) businesses in New York City and probably uh, each work 20 hours a day. Um, (laughs) But the main reason I wanted to talk to you is because I know that you like I have a toddler and but you're you're a little ahead of me. Your daughter's three. Is that right? She's three and a half. That's right. Mm -hmm. And mine just turned two. And I feel like I'm constantly trying, I'm constantly trying to figure out how to use what I know about dog training to be a better mother. Um, uh, And uh, I don't think I'm doing the worst job, at least. (laughs) Or or at least she's a very resilient child. Um, But I definitely have some areas where I feel like I could use some coaching and, you know, I think, I think BF Skinner said something like, um, the best math teacher for a first grader is a fifth grader or something like that. Um, so I thought oh, I maybe, love that. I've never heard that. Yes. I thought maybe as, as someone slightly, uh, more ahead of, ahead of, ahead in the game, uh, you might be able to provide some, some insight. So, I mean, do you find yourself, her name is Savannah. Is that right? Savannah. Yeah. What's your daughter's name? Magnolia. Ma- oh, that's beautiful. So oh, we, awesome. we both we both have these like hippy dippy <laughs> names for our little girl. <laughs> I want to name my child after nature. I want nature, to man. <laughs> <laughs> or or I don't know, like a drag queen or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. It could both be like your original, your first street name and your last name. Exactly. You remember exactly. that thing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, do you find yourself thinking about about anthrozoology as you're you're raising Savannah? I mean, constantly. I think because of what you said about being kind of a science nerd, and <laughs> so I. I kind of constantly think about it. And when I sit down and actually try to focus on it, I think, you know, for me, and this is really going to sound hippy dippy, but dog training and behavior and looking at human animal cultures is kind of a way of life in the same way that, you know, I also do martial arts and it's, it becomes a way of life. And there's something Mm. about dedicating yourself to uncovering truths in one area of your life that can kind of at least worthwhile truths that I think we can spread across all areas of our life and of course 
with our kids, we're focusing a lot on their behavior and trying to help them develop good behaviors. And a lot of what we do as dog trainers is try to help puppies develop good behaviors. And so mm-hmm. obviously, I think about it all the time. Um, in the thick of something, I don't always consciously go, oh, what dog training technique would be good here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't say I do that. But oftentimes when I'm reflecting on things, I do. I mean, because, and it's not even, it's not a secret that even when I'm training people at my facility, I'm not, I always use the same techniques on the people that I use on the dogs. And so it's not like I'm then saying my kid is the equivalent of a five-year-old dog or a two-year-old dog or anything like that. It's Mm, just that if I'm looking at a behavior and I don't like it or it's not working for our family, of course, I'm going to try to think of a way to change it. And then my natural default is, okay, let me break out my toolkit and say, oh, should we do progressive desensitization? Should we do <laughs> interrupt and redirect? Should we socialize for this? Are we, is she afraid? Mm-hmm. What's, what's the function of this behavior? Um, mm. <laughs> so I really do think about that a lot. Um, it's really interesting. My, my mother said something to me the other day about how, uh, about using dog training techniques with in parenting and I thought to myself how I I think she said it in a way that she thought I'd be defensive about like you know Mm -hmm. of course of course I don't treat my dog like a my child like a dog or something but I realize it's I don't think of it so much about using dog training techniques with my daughter as much as I think about it as using what I know about behavior with Mm -hmm. that I've learned through dog training with Mm -hmm. my daughter, but I know that there are people who learn about behavior in many different ways and apply it in many different ways. Um, it's just just a different application. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. I think you're thinking about changing behavior and so, or just even observing behavior. And so it doesn't have to be about using dog stuff on your kid, but I also think that at least for me, when I encounter, um, different comments like that it it comes up in class a lot too where someone will say oh I get it I'm the dog now um right right (laughs) you're you're training me training me (laughs) aha um for me and this is maybe a slightly different um philosophical conversation but it's worth mentioning that I don't necessarily think there needs to be a hierarchy Mm. between different species where we say oh well because the implication there is that if I am If it's funny (laughs) that I'm using a dog training technique on a human, then that's because we kind of devalue dogs. Uh, Ah, that's interesting. You know, and what they can be. And I don't think it's bad that it's funny. Of course it's funny. It helps us to shake up our our reality and our constructs and our paradigms a little bit. Um, But I... I don't think things need to be a hierarchy because it's sort of like forcing me to go, Oh, well, what's more important the way I treat a dog or the way I treat a person. Could I treat a dog less humanely because they're a dog? Um, Mm. Of course I don't treat dogs less humanely because they're dogs. Um, But there's a deeper philosophical conversation that we have to kind of dust off. I think when we look at that and whether or not it's offensive to use a dog training technique on a kid. That's really interesting. It makes two things. One, my line is always, you know, it's not about me training you or me training the dog. I think of myself as like a, like a, I'm just communicating, I'm facilitating communication between you. Mm -hmm. Um, That's, that's one line I use. But, um, uh, but the other thing I was going to say is, you know, as a, former journalist, one thing that always um, drives me crazy, and I think I've actually talked about this on the podcast before, is like the lead that you see in so many stories about pets that's like uh, something along the lines of like, Caroline woke up to the smell of lavender and then uh, was accompanied to the spa and had her nails done and then, you know, (laughs) took... Uh, took a movement class. Caroline is a King Charles Cavalier, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> or something like. <laughs> Car- Caroline is a dachshund. Where right. it's always like, of course, it's always in those stories. Like if you read the headline, you will have known it was about a dog. But but the way that it's um, and the, and then the conceit of of said article is usually about how ridiculous it is. Ridiculous it is that people pamper their dogs in a way that Mm -hmm. would normally be for humans anyway perhaps Mm -hmm. also maybe another conversation but I I get what you're saying where it's like it's not like a value judgment 
if you're using um, what you know about the science of behavior on one animal or another. It's just science. <laughs> right. It's just science. And, and we'd be foolish. We'd be truly foolish to spend our lives studying behaviors and doing some of the nerdy things we do, like sit and just watch behavior and take notes and try to figure out what was the antecedent and what was mm -hmm. the behavior and what was the consequence of that behavior and is it consistent and we spend all of this time training our observation skills so that we can look at a dog or look at a person and a dog together and figure out what's going on there if we were then to just like pack that up and leave it at work and come home and not use that observation skill on our, mm. on our children and our family that would that wouldn't make any sense to me. Um, of course, I'm going to use that. So here, for a reason. Yeah. here's one. So here's one issue that I'm having that, that with my daughter that um, maybe you can you can shed some light on. And I, I know we emailed a little bit about this. So um, we have we're, we're we don't have a lot of we're not very good at routines. I feel like in in our household, partially because like both my husband and I we run our own businesses. Um, I think working from home also uh, doesn't help set mm -hmm. like with us setting clear boundaries and um and uh and we also live in, it's kind of like a loft like there's not really like the bathroom is the only room with like a real door uh mm. so it's hard to corral um magnolia into one space although at the beginning of the um lockdown i uh, I did buy a bunch of baby gates because I was like, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> I need to keep the child in one area. Otherwise, I'm just going to run back and forth all day long every day. Um, so we do have some baby gates, which, um, you know, under duress, she could open if she had to, I think. Um, but uh, and, and she's not in a crib anymore. She's like in a, a, a twin size bed because she she was like not OK with a crib. Um, and part of the reason we got a twin size bed is because like she'll really only go to bed if one of us is like lying down with her. Um, mm -hmm. So all of this is to say our bedtime routine is like the worst part of my day. And um, and really the only thing that seems to work is just letting her stay up as long as she wants until like and sometimes that just means like like the whole family is watching Oh my god, I've seen everything on Disney Plus. I'm like Me too. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> like in the dregs of Disney Plus at this point. Like watching Thank like god the like the nineteen thirty five like Mickey Mouse videos just because I've seen all the other things. <laughs> or like so basically just like letting her stay up until like she absolutely can't keep her eyes open anymore, which is probably like the most peaceful way things go. Although of course it means like there's there's you know no no evening adult time um or like lying in bed with her fighting with her about you know wanting to like look at the phone or sometimes she'll read a book but then she'll get obsessed with like wanting to turn the light on and off 500 times or <laughs> um or she'll like run to get daddy because she needs a refill of her bottle or um the latest is she'll she'll start saying she wants to sit on the potty which is like a really clever ploy i think to that oh, she's figured out that one. <laughs> <laughs> like if if the if if the grown-ups let me sit on the potty then i won't have to go to sleep um right. and um and uh it just really it really sucks um and so i'm, I'm curious to hear hear how you approached yeah i mean look you're not the only one who struggles with sleep stuff there is i mean i think if you ever want to know if a large group vol number of people like if you ever want to know if a large number of people is struggling with an issue just like go to the bookstore or google on amazon how many books you get on that particular subject will give you a sign of like and like books and message boards and all of the like Facebook group, mom groups, everybody is concerned about sleep stuff. Um, and what I find most interesting about it when I talk to other moms is every kid, just like with our clients, right? So if we're really talking about how is this like dog training, just like with our clients, it's like every dog human diet is different. Mm. And every kid is different and every mom is different and every dad is different. Every household is different. And because of that, and because there's so much around sleep that is difficult, um, there is not a one size fits all cure for it. 
And so that's why you get all these, you get like the Ferber method, which is essentially cry it out. And then you've got like right. modified Ferber methods, <clears throat> um, which are a little bit of cry it out, a little bit of not cry it out. And then you've got um, co-sleeping, which is just bring your kid into the bed and stop worrying about it. Um, and all, you know, all manner of things in between. And I want know, what I think a lot of our dog clients dog training clients want, which is like the magic wand solution that someone's right. going to be like, have her drink a glass of milk and then jump up and down on one leg five times and yell the word raspberry and everything will be okay <laughs> or something. Because like, yeah, there are all these methods. And uh, I mean, well, let's talk about cry it out for a moment because I, I have friends who've done cry it out and, and my husband and I have moments where we're like, maybe that would have been the answer. But I feel like as an animal trainer, like, uh, really opposed to it. Um, I'm guessing you feel the same. Yeah, I, I really do agree because I mean, and this is where we started chatting by email is this cry it out thing is because it's using extinction. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, as an animal trainer, I like to leave the more aversive methods all the way at the end. And in my experience, you know, in the end of the list of things that I'm going to try. So um, for your, your listeners, if they've heard of LEMA, which is least invasive, minimally aversive methods, which a lot mm -hmm. of dog trainers subscribe to this, which is that we try doing things that are the least invasive first. If that doesn't work, we'll go to something slightly more invasive. And in my experience, typically, if you can't do it with the stuff that's gentler, then it, it really can't be done. Mm -hmm. um, that is if you're very skilled at the gentler things. And that's with dogs. But it's a lot different. The thing that's really tricky is when you're coaching somebody else's dog on how to do something, it's very easy to kind of give like a one, two, three, four, jump on one leg and cough and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're dealing with your own kid, they really do learn. And dogs do this too, of course. They learn how to push your individual buttons. Um, and that relationship can be more complicated than one, two, three, because you might get through steps one and two and then something changes. And now three isn't going to be successful. Um, but yes, yeah, so getting back to cry it out though. Um, the problem I have with it is that it seems overly aversive and there could be something in me to just psychologically um, as a mother that listening to my baby suffer like that, if it wasn't necessary um, in order to get some decent sleep habits was never going to happen. I mean, there, there was just such extreme suffering and understandable suffering. I think it's not like, mm she needs to have that level of suffering in order to develop a tough shell or something. I think it could potentially be kind of traumatic. Um, right. Well, you know, and like the way I think of it, it's like the behavior of crying might go away, but that doesn't mean that like the emotions of like the fear, the stress, the anxiety mm -hmm. about going to sleep is going away. It's just maybe going to like come out of a different hole in the sieve and you know, right. result in, in more tantrums during the day or just generally like her being more clingy or mm -hmm. I just like I don't, I don't want to do anything that's going to make her possibly less confident and self-assured and like living in the right. world or having nightmares or mm -hmm. fear of the dark or like you can think of a thousand ways that anytime you use that kind of aversive stuff it does it just pushes it into somewhere else um so yay I get to sleep but I don't in another sense, I can't sleep well because of what might have happened there. And I, I don't have anything against parents who've used this method. I think that, again, everybody's different. And I do understand that um, there is such a huge benefit to getting more sleep as a parent that maybe the benefits are worth it. But I don't know if that's true if there's another way to do it. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Like, it's like if I can get it to happen in another way and – and I think that you, I think that for the most part you can, um, but I have experience with my one kid. So I do feel like for this whole conversation, I have to say like, I'm not a child expert. Oh, of <laughs> so, course. Yeah, there are, there are, I feel like some, somebody who's got a, you know, a doctorate in child education is going to come on here and be like, what is she talking about? Um, but this is what worked for my kid. I'll tell you, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that this is what worked for my kid. Um, and it's a, it's a spinoff of progressive desensitization counter conditioning that we use for separation anxiety and with dogs. And the reason I think that that matters is there was a toddler book that I was reading at one point that talked about this, um, that it's all about the separation, right? So mm -hmm. anything around separating from mom 
and to some extent for dad too, but I find it to be more potent with mom is always fraught. So like dropping them off at a daycare or having them be even just a few feet away from you sometimes. Like I'm going to go across the room and they might be mad or I'm going to leave you alone for eight hours at night or 10 hours. That's a huge piece of separation. And I think that's why all of the anxiety around it. And if you think sort of historically about the human animal, like we didn't mm -hmm. separate from our kids like this for a long time. Mm -hmm. which is the big argument that co-sleepers make, right? Which is it's not natural for our kids to sleep separately. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's some merit to that argument. Personally, I don't sleep at all. If my child is in my bed, I don't sleep at all. I'm so sensitive to every single move. So I was mm -hmm. never, I was only able to do co-sleeping if I was completely exhausted. Um, <laughs> if you were drunk. <laughs> <laughs> in the early, like early infancy, during like, <laughs> Like I could do it a little bit when we were still really early infancy, you know, I could like pull her in the bed and out of bed. Mm -hmm. But uh, as soon as she was past like a year old, I could, I didn't do much co-sleeping because she always mm -hmm. kept me up is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> but um, Understood. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so having her in another room. And so what we did was um, leave for a short period of time. So yeah, there was some crying, but I wasn't completely abandoning her. Um, so I would put her into the bed and I'll still do this if she has a really bad day, but it typically doesn't happen. It hasn't happened for a long time. So that might give you some hope. Um, <laughs> if I put her into the bed and we do a whole routine around it, and this is where I really do relate it back to dogs, creating a separation anxiety routine, mm -hmm. um, where I think of them as trigger warnings with dogs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of it the same way with Savannah. It's like, I'm letting you know that this is coming. And what's interesting with dogs is that when we do this, we all also talk about desensitizing all the triggers. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for any listeners who don't know the bait, I'll give them a little bit of the basics of desensitization program, which is um, for separation anxiety, which is that you start like getting the dog used to things like putting on your coat and even opening the door before you try leaving the dog alone. And so I found, interestingly, I almost did the opposite with Savannah, but that has informed some things that I do with dogs. So instead of getting rid of everything that was going to warn her that I would leave, I made it the same every single time. Um, huh, okay. And it's, it's weird because it, I feel like with a dog, that would have the opposite effect. Um, but so we do the same thing every single night. So she knows exactly when that trigger is coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we sit. And well, we it's the idea of like whenever you're dealing with an animal who has anxiety, making things very predictable can be. Useful. Right. And actually, exactly. as you're, as you're saying this, I have an idea, which I haven't had before, which is like, I wonder if like when, when it's not bedtime, I could practice going to bed, like her going to bed, like make it into a game, Ooh. which I hadn't thought of. Um, but that's the kind of thing we do with dogs too. Like, you know, practice, right? Like practice mommy going out the door, mm -hmm. um, even when it's not time to leave. But go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted Yeah, you. that's a good idea. And that's a way of desensitizing the triggers um, in a different way. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, I wonder. The funny thing, just a sidebar, uh, the mm -hmm. funny thing about making things a game around bedtime, the tricky spot that I found um, is sometimes when I make things really fun around bedtime, she picks up on that and figures out ways to <laughs> prolong that piece of it. Oh, no, let's play mm. this game. One more minute. One more minute. Oh, three kisses. No, 30 kisses. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> keeps going longer and longer and longer. She has a lot more verbal now than she did when she was two. Mm. Um, so she can ask for things like that. But but yeah, okay, so going back to the pattern, you know, you read two books and only two books. Um, we get into the bed, we do 10 hugs, and then we do one minute of padding, and then mama leaves. Mm -hmm. um, and I did find that one piece of it that was necessary is I would give her the trigger warning. So I'm going to sit here and sing the song for one minute, and then when the song is over, I'm going to leave. I have to make sure she hears that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you'll start to get your reaction then. Right. As soon as you let them know it's coming. And sometimes it helps her to not have as big of a reaction. And I got a little variation on that. Um, but once the song was over, then I leave. But I would leave for a very short period of time. And in this way, it's very similar to like doing separation anxiety. I'm going to leave and come right back. Um, when you start leaving the dog alone, um, I'm sure you have a protocol that's somewhere along those lines. Right? So you leave and then come back in. 
mm-hmm. and then leave for progressively longer periods of time. That's exactly what I did with Savannah. I would leave for about 10 seconds, come back in, double that amount of time, double that amount of time, double that amount of time. And I actually got that idea from a, a toddler book that I read. I can't remember which one now. Um, and thought, now, when you come back yeah. in, do you say, do you like praise in any way or do you let her know that you're there or your just presence is enough? You know, that's a good question. I, I based that a lot on instinct. The recommendation in the book was specifically go back in quick pat pat, everything's okay. And then walk out again. Mm-hmm. I typically spend a little bit more time than that helping her settle down. And that was just based on instinct but not too long because there's a, there's a tipping point where, you know, the, they start putting on a show of crying so that you'll come back. There's like a tipping point. Um, so it's, it's gotta be very regimented. Otherwise they can start to work the system a little bit. Um, that would be my guess on that, but, but I would follow my instinct and follow my heart. And it was kind of based a little bit on how upset she was like legitimately upset, not putting on a show of being upset. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's a very subtle difference there. And I think both are rooted in anxiety, but, but still I would go back in and it'd be brief, but sincere. And then I would leave and tell her, I'm going to be right back, leave. And then I'd come back in 20 seconds. And there was some crying. So there is a, a piece of it that is a little bit aversive for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but she knows I'm coming back and I'm coming back and I'm coming back. And it, it really did work. Um, the hardest part I think was, the tedium of having to go back and forth. forth. But you know what? It's a lot easier than. Sure. Right. Than dealing with. Everything else that you do to try, you know, watching 15 hours of Aladdin. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about it. Versions one and two. (laughs) Uh... Um, Do you, does she go to bed at the same time every night? Yes. Um, I have a little more flexibility in that now that Mm -hmm. we have a a solid routine underway, but yeah, it was, I would schedule my entire life around her sleeping routine. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from my, also from a dog thing, it's schedule, schedule, schedule. Like the more routine things are, the more she'll thrive. I always thought. Um, and so, and I, I had the hardest time with that when I was dealing with anything in my life that involved non-parents. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. and it was very easy to coordinate when with other people who had had small kids <laughs> it's like nope nap time is coming I'm leaving <laughs> we gotta go <laughs> uh, it's so yeah. funny it's like my husband and I have like such a hard time with that kind of thing we're so like just like whatever about things about I, I don't know with, with her um <laughs> you know it, I, I feel bad admitting this but like one thing that I find I have trouble with is like feeding her three times a day. (laughs) She, she gets fed and and it's not a problem, but I, 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 I'm not so bad just about like making sure I eat three times a day (laughs) normally that like, I have to like really force myself to be like, she is a child and she must have she must, eat. <laughs> she must have the regular meal it's not that not that i don't want to feed her i just like literally like well, sometimes we'll well i'll take her out for a walk and it'll be like 11 o'clock i'll be like oh my god I forgot to feed her um, i mean there's a lot of food prep in yeah. motherhood like a lot of food prep it's I understand why like old time stay-at-home moms were literally like wearing aprons and cooking all day long because that's what you could do. I mean, you've got breakfast and lunch and dinner and two snacks. Plus you have to feed yourself. That's three more meals. That's six and two halves meals a day. Yeah. A I, I, I mean, fortunately my husband does all of that. Cause I probably would not have had children if I had to like, <laughs> if I had to figure out the food piece of the puzzle, like that's, that's always actually, you know, it's interesting though. Like in some ways I feel like being a dog trainer made me think about my my food regimen a little bit better because I've always like as in my adult years, I've just, again, been so sort of like all over the place with food Mm -hmm. Um, where something about like, you know, I'm like, if if I can help people set up routines for their dogs, I think I can probably like figure out a good routine for myself so that it's not like every day when I have to go eat something, I'm like reinventing the wheel, (laughs) Um, which is how I used to feel. You just have to prepare yourself some Kongs and toss them in the freezer. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. I like, I wish it were that easy. Well, I kind of like figured out like ways to make it that easy, but that, I mean, not literally eating food out of Kongs, but although I have a friend who's a dog trainer um, 
and uh I, well i won't name her although she probably would not deny to this but she used to like make herself she used to make herself like dog food patties basically they weren't dog food but they were like perfectly balanced meals containing i don't know like i, I don't even know what she would put in them they were meat based mm. meat based like patties that she would um like wrap in tin foil and like have on the go and they contained everything that she needed for the day i guess it's kind of like the soylent <laughs> soylent movement or whatever like that sounds delicious yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, i think i like the taste of food more than your friend <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um any other any other ways in which you think like being a dog trainer has made you a better parent or a worse parent. <laughs> or how run, running a business makes you a better uh, or a worse parent. <laughs> God, you know, I, I struggle with the running a business aspect of it, especially in this last year because um, it got so hard. I don't know if you have this experience, but last yeah. year was definitely my hardest year running a business ever. Um, I, I struggle with it because I do sort of subscribe to, I want my daughter to see mama having a career and feeling fulfilled and things like that. But I also do, as most working moms do, I always feel guilty when I'm away from my daughter, but then I, you know, all of those things that people worry about. Um, but yeah, um, the, the other things in terms of dog and like behavior skills and things like that, um, the other really big one, really big obvious one is the potty training one. Mm, um, mm-hmm. Because as dog trainers, we spend a lot of time teaching animals when and where to go pee. So um, I thought, I remember leading up to it, like, I was like, oh, this is just going to be so easy. This is what I do for a living. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I've, um, had, I've had the same feeling, but go on. <laughs> yeah, but and I, and I actually think it probably this is one of those funny things about parenting is hindsight makes it seems easy in hindsight when it probably wasn't as easy in reality, but I definitely had moments of frustration, but we did the, um, there's a book called, Oh crap. Have you heard of it? Yes, I have. Yeah. That's the method that I I read that book and went, this is potty training. This is what I'm doing. And so, because it's exactly what, it's almost exactly what I tell my clients to do for puppies, but translated into more human form. So there's some big biological differences, obviously, between puppies and little kids when you're trying to house train, but it was basically an interrupt and redirect. I mean, catch them every time and bring them to the potty and make it a positive experience and boom, you got a a potty trained kid and it worked pretty well. Have you been potty training with your baby? Um... Yes, but I haven't been too hardcore about it. Um, on the young I, side, yeah. I feel like, um, yeah, I, I feel like when my when my friends talk about it, I'm like, this is just dog training. This is just dog training. Mm. Um, and uh, when she, it's funny actually, when she was much, when she was very little, I was much more on top of like getting her on the potty when I thought she had to go, even mm. though it was like she was really kind of too, too young. I mean, not too young, but very much on the young side. Um, whereas, uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I, now I, I'm like, I, especially she, she has a pretty good tell at this point when she has to poop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I've gotten pretty, uh, pretty good at, at trying to get her on, on the potty when um, she has to poop and, uh, and she gets a piece of chocolate Um after she goes although i've i've tried to be careful about she only gets one piece um well she's never gone on the toilet more than like one pee and one poop a day um Mm. but i i don't want to get in the trap of her peeing and pooping constantly so that she can get jelly beans kind of thing Um, right but um yeah i'm trying to uh give her um give her uh chocolate when she goes although it's interesting a friend of mine kind of was tell- I, I i've had a lot of friends tell me about um oh crap and and kind of summarize it a little bit for me and one of my friends was insistent like she's like it's not a reward-based method which i don't know did, did you find that to be the case yeah. um i disagree with that and maybe that maybe that friend isn't as well versed in like operant quadrant as we are um oh that's you know what i mean true mm-hmm. <laughs> Because I think people have a misconception about reward, a lot of misconceptions about what it means, um, reward based. But um, it's in the oh crap book, she she emphasizes that confidence is the reinforcer, right? So that um, feeling of being proud. And I think this is an interesting thing to think about in terms of differences between 
raising kids and raising dogs is that one of the big, I could restate that actually, that something that raising both animals has in common is that you have to look for what is reinforcing, right? Um, Mm -hmm. So some dogs would be reinforced by a piece of candy or a piece of treat. And some dogs are not as reinforced by treats and maybe are more reinforced by play, right? So kids, yes, absolutely. They're reinforced by chocolate and Skittles, but in a different way than things that make them feel proud Mm -hmm. and things that make them feel confident. And I think something we have to look for as reinforcer in our kids are those feelings reinforcers. Mm -hmm. It's like, I feel like I was successful versus I feel like I failed. Um, So the feeling of failure is punishing and the feeling of success is reinforcing. Um, And so a lot of what we did for reinforcer was celebration, which (laughs) we do a little bit with puppies, right? We have a potty party, maybe like you'll go crazy with your puppy. (laughs) But um, I did a lot of that with Savvy. I didn't do too much candy with the potty. And I think that was based on the book, the book's recommendation that it should be something they do to feel proud of themselves I think she mm-hmm. says it. she says it's something like that um but at her daycare they did do stickers um so you I think sometimes you can use these I think it's a definitely something to discuss is like what types of reinforcers should I use and when um we use candy for eating all of your dinner okay or, or eating your vegetables we definitely do that um and it's it's actually it, it's we should talk about um bribing a bit because (laughs) one of the most common misconceptions with uh, reinforcement based training or reward based training is that you're always bribing your dog. Okay. And, you know, obviously we as trainers, we know that the goal is actually to reinforce and not to bribe. Um, One of the most common questions I ask my classes, right, is what's the difference? And most people don't know um, that the difference is when you present, and this is all for your listeners, obviously, um, the difference is when you present that piece of candy, right? So if I wave a piece of chocolate in front of Magnolia and say, if you use the potty, I'm going to give you some chocolate, we would call mm-hmm. that a bribe. But if we right. wait till after she uses the potty, we give the chocolate. Okay. So I think that this comes up a lot in parenting <laughs> because it's not, I don't click and treat, right? I don't wait until Savannah does a behavior then suddenly produce a piece of chocolate. I don't find that to be as easy to do with her as mm-hmm. it is with a dog <laughs> for some right. reason. Like, you put on your shoes. Surprise. Here's a new coloring book. I, it's harder. <laughs> <laughs> the timing is harder. Yeah. <laughs> and then it also, it doesn't, it does seem to work a little bit to, to lead with the incentive. Um, but then that becomes a bribe. And this is something that I wrestle with. What do you think about this whole bribing versus reinforcing with your kids? Do you experience it with Magnolia? Um, you know, it's funny. My, my old dog who who we lost recently um my my husband like ruined his training by always bribing him basically <laughs> like i couldn't train my husband to not bribe him um so it definitely got to the point where he was like where where's where's the yummies not doing it without the yummies um with magnolia i guess i haven't thought about it so much i guess i've thought about it more like in terms of um making her aware of consequences mm-hmm. uh, of like the possible consequences of her behavior but i haven't thought about that in terms of you know whether that's a bribe or not which is it's just interesting it just like hadn't occurred to me um but um like i'm trying i'm trying to think of like an example of of uh when that's come into play um Tricky. I don't I'm trying know. To yeah, think of something other than candy where I've noticed this. I do. I I notice it when I'm when I'm doing things. I'm like, oh shoot, I'm bribing right now. Um, but you know what I? <laughs> yeah, you know what I do a lot with her, um, which is, is just I, I guess a different topic. But I I um uh I let her discover like consequences on her own a lot. Like for mm-hmm. instance, um. Like if she doesn't want to put her coat on to go outside, I'll just mm-hmm. be like, okay, well, once we get outside, you're probably going to want to put your coat on. <laughs> <laughs> or um, I've done that too. <laughs> um, or <Okay. laughs> yeah. Um, or I'm also very, um, uh, you know, it's, in the last few months, she's gotten into um, 
temper tantrums where she like goes face flat on the ground usually like in the middle of the sidewalk on like third avenue in manhattan (laughs) like like decide she you know doesn't want to go in that direction and just like like totally like pancakes (laughs) and um and uh my husband's approach to that is like he'll just like pick her up and like we'll keep moving Mm. um where I'm like eh, no like I'm just I mean part of it is like I'm pregnant right now like I'm just not gonna like pick up and like drag a screaming child with me <laughs> um so I'll just like stand there and wait um mm-hmm. I just I'm like really good I think at like waiting her out and which um I I, I to me that and uh, to some extent I feel like that's just like my nature like I think I probably would have done that even before I was a dog trainer um I I grew up with like a a a babysitter who was like the queen of like stonewalling um (laughs) so maybe that's part of what it comes from um but I do think it is an effective way of like not inadvertently positively reinforcing the behavior of throwing a tantrum by giving her attention Mm -hmm. um and uh and I think that's important. Like so much of the time when we are scolding kids or, or, or even just like showing exasperation, I think like we're giving them what they want. Um, but I also feel like I remember as a kid, the feeling of like not wanting to give in, you, mm-hmm. know, you know what I mean? Like you're, mm-hmm. when you're upset about something and like, even though, you know, maybe you've gone beyond <laughs> a reasonable point. Like, I feel like I kind of remember that feeling of like, I don't, like I, I'm just gonna keep pulling on this rope because I've like invested this much in it. Yeah. Um, so like if I could just like let her get to the point of deciding on her own. Um, but what's funny in especially in like that specific kind of situation, which has happened a few times, um, like literally in the middle of the sidewalk on Third Avenue, is every, because everyone's wearing a mask. I can't mm-hmm. tell when they're walking by and <laughs> seeing what's going on if they're like, if they're like. <laughs> smiling or scowling in disapproval i can't tell, I can't tell if you're judging me or not I yeah, which i guess is me. just as well <laughs> i guess it's just as well but that's an interesting the the question about like bribing because like i think uh, yeah i mean with with dogs i'm i'm always telling people to try and avoid bribing and yet with kids i feel like we take it for granted that we you know, do say like, you can't have, you know, if you want to have your dessert, you have to finish your vegetables kind of thing, which I guess you could, could say is, is, is a bribe. Um, Right. Right. But it, and I guess it's really more of a problematic bribe only if they're refusing. Right. And, and then we offer, and then the consequence of their refusal is that we offer chocolate. I think that's when it becomes more of a problem than, if it's something that always exists as a possibility, right? So the conditions are, there are vegetables in front of you. You know that if those vegetables disappear, Uh those conditions, a chocolate will appear. Um, So I I think there's there's some play in it, but it has definitely made me sort of tease at some of those little strings a little bit more. Um, It's interesting that like, when you're talking about tantrum, it makes me think of my daughter's, what I call the big scream. Um, She has, (laughs) where... That, that it's taken us some time to play. She's actually still doing this sometimes, not nearly as often as she was, but uh, around, right about three, maybe a little bit sooner than three, she started doing this massive scream where it was just like, it would hit a point of whatever. She wasn't allowed to do something or she wasn't happy with the circumstances. And she would just look at you dead in the eye and give the biggest blood curdling scream. Possible. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> The first time it happens, of course, you as a parent react. You like, I think a really awesome child care provider would maybe not react like your babysitter. But <laughs> you're like, oh my god, you screamed in my face. Um, and so I tried a lot of different things. One of which, one of the first things I tried, which I think was probably not my best idea, um, was leaving the room when she did it. Like, you know, if you're not going to be nice to me, I don't want to play with you. I'm leaving. And <laughs> <laughs> and it made her really upset and she would chase me out of the room and it would stop the scream, but it didn't stop the frequency of the big scream, right? So obviously there was something in that that wasn't working or, and I haven't totally unlocked this mystery, um, 
And now I'm trying instead staying in the room, but not having a reaction to see if no reaction as a consequence helps. And it does seem to be working a lot better, um, but staying close by, because again, I had a problem with that abandonment punishment that bugged mm. me. It was mm-hmm. too severe for me. Um, and I think with her bigger tantrums, I, um, I found myself frequently asking what the function was because Mm -hmm. I think that kids need to have tantrums sometimes and that it's Mm. not something I just feel like they're, they're developing all of these emotions and they're strong emotions and they don't yet know what to do with them. Um, at, and some of these ideas I get from, I, my, my daughter goes to a really awesome daycare, um, And they're all like, all these people have degrees in childhood education and stuff. So they give me a lot of ideas. But one of the things that they have is a calm your body chair. And Hmm. it's a a little beanbag chair in the corner with like clouds painted around it and stuff. And whenever they're feeling really angry or really upset, they're allowed to go over there and beat that chair and scream and cry and then sit down and calm their body and then come back when their body is calm. And it worked like a charm when Savvy was your age, so or your baby's age, not your age. <laughs> when Savvy was Magnolia's age, um, so it might be worth trying. It stopped working after a while, but for quite some time, we would say you're feeling a lot of, a lot of feelings. The, let's go to your calmer body chair and we just beat the chair up. Obviously, this doesn't work on Third Avenue, um, but <laughs> mm-hmm. it works at home, which is mm-hmm, the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, to the point where it got to a point where I could look at Savannah and say. Um, do you need to go calm your body? And she would go, yes. And she would run over there and do her thing. And um, I could keep doing what I was doing. Um, it, all of that to say, I think sometimes the function of the tantrum is is expression of emotion. And mm-hmm. so we have to make sure that if that's what, what is needed, that we have an outlet for that um, so that it doesn't, as you said earlier, sort of pop out in other places. Um, but the, if the function of the behavior is to get attention, then what you were saying about needing to kind of reserve that attention, that patience, and wait for some behavior you like, and then capture that behavior by bringing your attention back, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, in that, but then you, it's difficult to tell which is which. Sometimes you have to kind of identify what's going on, and sometimes it's a mix of both, right? Um, so they don't make it easy on us. <laughs> Damn kids. <laughs> have you used a leash with Savannah? No, I haven't. Have you? <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, and she's gone back and forth on it. There have been times actually where it, the, actually the leash that I use is um, or the harness that I use is a dog backpack that we sell in our online store or in our shop too. <laughs> um, and uh <laughs> and and there've been times where it, where she like actually wants to put it on um but then there's other times where she seems like she really doesn't want to put it on but the the main times that I that I've used it is she's really really interested in in um in walking the dog and mm-hmm. uh so I've used it at times so and she wants to walk the dog herself you know it's all about like you know mm-hmm. mommy's not helping um so I've used it uh when I've let her walk the dog but then of course I also have to have like so I have her on the leash and then I also have the dog on a leash and then I have and she's has the leash on the dog so but I also have the leash on the dog because I don't want her obviously walking the dog alone so right so it ends up being a lot of leashes (laughs) (laughs) you know what's funny about this this actually is one of the the most amusing things I think that highlights this sort of um, way we think of dogs hierarchically, like I was talking about Mm -hmm. earlier, why would I be comfortable putting a dog on a leash, but not comfortable putting a kid on a leash? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, I think a lot of people feel like they don't want to put a leash on their child, but we would do it for all the same reasons that we would put a leash on a dog for their safety. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I th- I haven't used one, but in theory, I have zero problem with it. And I totally would if there was any, re- you know, if there was a situation. We have spent slightly less time, or probably considerably less time in the city walking around um, than probably you and your daughter have because we have a house in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So well, right. I mean, a lot of the time it feels like it feels more humane to have her like on a leash than to mm-hmm. like forcibly strap her into a stroller. Um, right. And, uh, you know, for a two year old, there's only so much walking, holding my hand that that uh, that she'll do without. Mm-hmm. I mean, although, you know, again, that's something to work on. Um, and we do work on it. But um, oh, you know what I do there? I do mm-hmm. putting a problem behavior on cue. Um, so <laughs> Ooh, tell, tell me more. <laughs> um, so I do. Okay. Now we're running free. Now we hold hands. Now we're running free. Now we hold hands. And I did have to do, um, and I definitely did this a lot in the city. I did have to do just like I would do with a dog wait at an intersection. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you had to be holding my hand when we crossed the street and I was having zero, I was hearing zero, um, pushback on that. And so I made that boundary really, really clear. And then we were on, when we were on wider sidewalks, I would cue, okay, freedom. And then she could run around. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Another, another, (laughs) another dog trainer suggested, um, uh, playing a lot of the freeze game. Oh Uh, yeah. Did you try that? Uh, I haven't done that yet really, but not yet, but I, I think it's a good idea. Oh yeah, the start and stop games. Yeah, Savannah's still into start and stop games. Um, yeah, you can really prime those with some music. Sitting, um, I don't know how far along are you pregnancy wise. You need to put your feet up yet. Yeah, so sitting with your feet up <laughs> and an iPhone or something, mm-hmm. and just cueing music, start and stop, and make it a, a dance and freeze game, and prime that. <laughs> That's a good idea. I know mm-hmm. what I'll be tonight <laughs> <laughs> that's a good wear your wear your child's body out game <laughs> well this has been so much fun thank you for taking the time to talk and uh, I do feel like there's so many other things we could talk about but I'm happy to talk about parenting as opposed to anything else for a little while <laughs> 100% I love what a, what a fun conversation I'm really glad we did this thanks thanks for having me on your yeah on your and podcast. and maybe at one day in the future when people can meet up in person again we can have a a, a a daughter and mommy play date. I would love that. I'm looking forward to it. I'll come when when you have when you have the new baby in tow. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll carry the baby for a little while so you can rest and we'll let our kids Aww. play and we'll have the best time. That sounds <laughs> great. And we'll have and we'll have beverages. <laughs> yes, and no masks on. I pray. No masks. All right. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. Hope to hope to connect again soon. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Annie.